Welcome to the second season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Syracuse in the state of New York received the highest annual snowfall of any city in the U.S., with almost 10 feet of snow every winter. The small city has roughly 150,000 residents. As a child growing up, Stacy was headstrong, stubborn, and inquisitive. In fact, her mother Judy limited her to asking why three times per day. In high school, Stacy had plans to become a paralegal or a lawyer. But then she met Michael Wallace in 1985 and knew within the first five minutes that she was going to marry him. He was outgoing and always the life of the party. Within a few years, they got married. A couple years later, daughter Ashley was born. She told ABC News that, I knew from that minute on, my whole reason for being here was to take care of her. A few years later, daughter Bree joined the family. Mike doted on little Bree, calling her his little princess. Ashley noticed this, and Stacy felt bad, so she paid extra attention to Ashley. Mother and daughter became very close, each other's best friend. Sometimes, Mike enjoyed alcohol and drugs a little too much, and it became a source of tension in the family. Like many in Syracuse, money was tight. Stacy worked for a company that dispatched ambulances, and Mike was a mechanic. She worked days, and he worked nights. They rarely sat down to dinner together. Over the years, the couple drifted apart, and there were rumors of affairs on both sides. In the fall of 1999, Stacy confided in a girlfriend that she was planning to divorce Mike. But with Christmas coming, she didn't want to upset the girls and put it off. Then Stacy changed her mind and instead decided she'd rather be a widow so she could collect his life insurance. It's not known exactly how, but Stacy started serving antifreeze to Mike. It has a sweet taste so she may have poured him a drink with a little antifreeze stirred in. The ethylene glycol in antifreeze is lethal, and it only takes 8 ounces to kill an adult. Ethylene glycol doesn't leave the system, but rather it builds up and forms crystals in the body. Over time, it affects the central nervous system and causes headaches, confusion, and slurred speech, eventually leading the heart, liver, and kidneys to fail. But Stacy was devious. She didn't give it to him all at once. Rather, she slipped him a little bit at a time. In early December, Mike wasn't feeling well and was treated for vertigo. At a family dinner on Christmas Eve, his family noticed he appeared puffy and was coughing a lot and encouraged him to see a doctor. January 11th, 2000 was a cold winter day. Clouds and wind rolled in. The temperature hung around 40 degrees. Stacy was at work and Mike was sick at home on the couch. Their daughter Ashley, who was 11, noticed that he seemed to be making a funny face. Then he lifted his arm straight up in the air, rested it back down on his side, then it fell forward. Ashley had no idea what had happened, 
and it was time for her to pick up her younger sister at school. When she returned, an ambulance took Mike to the hospital. Doctors told Stacy that Mike had died from a heart attack. He was only 38. Mike's older sister, Rosemary, wasn't so sure. The skin on his chest and head were a dark purple. It seemed so very odd. She wanted an autopsy performed, but Stacy declined, saying that she had no reason to question the doctors. Stacy received $55,000 in life insurance. She paid for Mike's funeral and burial at Alaska Rural Cemetery. Mike's headstone featured two hearts side by side, his name in one, hers in the other. Between them, etched in stone, were the words, Together, Forever. Stacy never shed a tear. She took the girls for a trip to Disney World. Stacy was a single mom for a few years. Then she met David Castor, a divorced dad with an adult son. David loved the outdoors, rode a snowmobile, jet ski, motorcycle, and enjoyed camping. He wasn't really interested in being a stepfather. He'd already raised a son, and he was very open about his feelings with Stacy. But that didn't stop her from marrying him in 2003. It wasn't long before their marriage wasn't a happy one. And Stacy thought, Well, I got away with it once. I should do it again. So she began to poison her second husband. David's health had taken a tumble after he had a motorcycle accident, so no one was surprised when it worsened after he got married. In August 2005, Syracuse was experiencing a heat wave and the temperature had soared to 83. David always closed his business for the last two weeks and went on vacation. That year, he wanted to take Stacy on an extensive holiday without the girls. She didn't feel she could leave her daughter's home alone for that long. After all, they were still teenagers. On Saturday, August 20th, the couple had a huge fight about it and argued for seven hours straight. At some point, Stacy poured a glass of apricot brandy mixed with cranberry juice and added a splash of antifreeze and handed it to David. Later, when he was unable to walk, she called a family friend and asked for his help to get him into bed. She asked the friend if she should call an ambulance, but he thought David would be fine. Stacy locked the bedroom door, and she and the girls went on with their lives that weekend. She told friends that he had locked himself away to get drunk, and she would put her ear to the door every so often and could hear him breathing. Late Sunday night, without the girls seeing, she let herself into the bedroom. When he became too incapacitated to drink, she got a turkey baster from the kitchen drawer, filled it with antifreeze, and dropped it into his mouth. The next morning, Stacy called 911. She told the dispatcher that David had locked himself in their bedroom the day before and wasn't responding to her phone calls. Police arrived. They knocked on the bedroom door. There was no answer. Sergeant Robert Willoughby kicked the door in. Laying on the bare mattress, in vomit and blood, was David, face down, dead at 48. Stacy told police that her husband was suicidal. They began a search of the house and found a prescription bottle. Then Detective Dominic Spinelli lifted the lid on a garbage can in the kitchen. Looking down, he spotted a turkey baster and thought 
Dot looked awed. He carefully reached in and picked it up and faintly smelled alcohol. Detectives noticed three bottles on the wooden nightstand beside the bed. Between the phone and clock sat a bottle of apricot brandy, cranberry juice, and antifreeze. There were also two round glasses, one empty and one half full of a bright green liquid. Under the bed, they found a jug of antifreeze. David had drawn up a will four years earlier, leaving everything to his then-wife Janice, and in the event of her death, it would go to their son David Jr. Stacy set out to change that. She forged a new will and had a friend witness it. Stacy inherited everything. David's death was ruled a suicide by antifreeze poisoning. Stacy buried him in the plot next to her first husband, just a few feet to his left. On his headstone, etched under David's name, were the words, Husband of Stacy. Two dead husbands made investigators suspicious. David's first wife Janice told detectives that he would not have committed suicide. Forensics came back that the half-full glass of green antifreeze didn't contain David's fingerprints as expected, but it did contain three of Stacy's fingerprints. And tests ran on the turkey baster, found traces of antifreeze, and on the tip was David's DNA. So investigators kept digging. Two years later, in September 2007, Detective Spinelli made the difficult decision to exhume Mike's body. He never wants to disturb someone at peace, but felt his instincts were right. He was there when the backhoe bucket broke through the grass and reached down to the dark hole and filled its bucket with dirt, bucket after bucket, until the casket was revealed. Detective Spinelli told ABC News that he recalled thinking, what if he's saying, it's about time you guys are looking at this because I didn't just die on my own. And lo and behold, at the medical examination, they found crystals, the type that are formed by ingesting ethylene glycol in antifreeze. Mike's death was reclassified as a homicide by poisoning. Detective Spinelli, along with another detective, drove to meet Stacy and asked her, Stacy, there were two glasses sitting on the nightstand. You say that you poured him some cranberry juice at one point, right? And Stacy replied, yes. Detective Spinelli said, I'm going to show you a picture of those two glasses. Do you remember which glass it was that you poured the cranberry juice in? She looked at it and said, Well, when I poured the antifreeze, I, uh... Then she stopped and said, I mean, the cranberry juice. Detective Spinelli stated, But you said antifree. Stacy replied, You know I don't like this. You're trying to frame me. You're trying to pin this on me, and I'm done. And she stopped the interview. Police put a wiretap on Stacy's phone. Ashley was at college getting ready for the new school year. Using the wiretap, police listened to Stacy talking to a friend and could hear her typing on a keyboard. Stacy was feeling the pressure detectives were putting on her, and this is where it took a bizarre twist. She devised a plan to throw suspicion off her and on to Ashley in a suicide note that confessed to the murders. Pretending to be her daughter, she turned to her computer, 
It took a few tries, and she saved a draft copy before coming up with the final version. 42 lines, single-spaced. The one-page note addressed to Mummy referred to Mike. I told you when Daddy died, it was all my fault. And it was Daddy doing things you never knew about. He was drinking and smoking pot. I saw him. He was mean to you and me, and only ever loved Bree. I couldn't let him do those things to you anymore. When I got home from school that day, I knew what was going on. Daddy was barely breathing. I knew he was going to die. That's why I didn't call you for help or anyone else. Then she wrote about David. We were happy for a while, just the three of us. And then you married David. And he was mean to you. He was mean to all of us. Meaner than Dad. I never thought anyone would miss David. Friday, when David came home so you could go to the post office, is when I first did it. It was easy. I asked him if he wanted something to drink, and I put the antifree in his glass with some soda. He drank two whole glasses. That was it. Only it took longer for David than with Daddy. Once I put the antifree in Daddy's Gatorade, it only took a day or so. Then she ended the note with, I can't live like this and watch what they are doing to you. Not anymore. But I can't go to jail for the rest of my life. I can't put you through that. I did the only thing I could to help you, Mummy. Please forgive me. Make sure you take care of Bree. She is all you have left now. Signed, Ashley. Ashley was attending her first day of college when two detectives made her a surprise visit. They asked her about her father and stepfather, then dropped the news that they may have been murdered. Ashley's head was spinning, and she did what came natural. She called her mother. Stacy picked her up from school and drove her home and suggested they get drunk. It was an odd way to deal with the news, but Ashley went along with it. Stacy poured her daughter a glass of watermelon Smirnoff. Ashley thought it tasted awful, but Stacy encouraged her to drink it. The next morning, Ashley woke up with a nasty hangover, but managed to go to school. When she got home that night, Stacy poured her another drink mixed in some crushed prescription pills, and handed her daughter the glass. Ashley passed out. Syracuse.com reported that her younger sister Bree found her unconscious with pillows over her head. She found the suicide note, and after reading only a few lines, handed it to her mother. Stacy called 911. In the hospital... Ashley woke up to detectives, showing her the suicide note and confession. She adamantly denied writing the note or killing her father and stepfather. Detectives believed her. On September 14th, Stacy was arrested and charged with second-degree murder for David's death and was also charged with attempted murder of her daughter Ashley. Her trial began in January 2009. Stacy admitted to her lawyer that she had forged David's will. During the grueling 90-minute cross-examination, she remained calm and insisted it was Ashley who killed Mike and David. A forensic computer expert testified that the suicide note had been written on the computer in Stacy's home when Ashley was at school and that they were able to retrieve fragments. The note included the word antifree four times, a word Stacy had used before. A linguist specialist testified that the wording used in the note 
was Stacy's terminology and not Ashley's. The jury was out for a long time, which is never a good sign. Some feared it could be a hung jury. Finally, they returned with a verdict. Stacy was found guilty of second-degree murder for David's death and guilty of attempting to murder her daughter Ashley. At her sentencing, both Ashley and David Jr. read victim impact statements. The New York Daily News reported that the judge told Stacy, In my 34 years in the criminal justice system, as a lawyer and a judge, I have seen serial killers, contract killers, killers of every variety and stripe. But I have to say, Mrs. Castor, you are in a class all by yourself. He sentenced her to 51 years. She would be eligible for parole in 2055 when she would be 87. Stacy appealed her conviction. It was denied. David Jr. referred to his father's gravesite as Stacy's Shrine of Evil. Central New York News reported that after her conviction, David's son went to court and requested permission to remove his father's remains and bury them elsewhere. On Saturday, June 11th, in 2016, Stacy died of a heart attack in prison. She had served seven years. Stacy planned to be buried next to her two dead husbands that she had murdered, but the judge granted David Jr.'s request. His father's final resting place is now miles away from Stacy, and the headstone bearing her name was destroyed. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. During spring break, we're featuring a new recording of one of our fan favorites. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Mackenzie Cowell and the Beauty School Murder. Mackenzie suffered a brutal and violent death. A beautiful, bright, strong 17-year-old high school senior when she disappeared. A classmate pled guilty. Now, he says he's innocent. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fastlane Studios, and our many editorial sources who were listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.